we react or respond to issues and topics without questioning why we do what we do. Why we face the dilemmas and adversities and the struggles that we do. My challenge to you all is to look deeper into human behavior and human interactions. Welcome to Forbidden Fruits. So I'm sitting here today with a living legend, Dr. Naeem Akbar. Dr. Naeem Akbar is a world-renowned clinical psychologist who has taught at many institutions, um, one of them being the institution I'm going to be an alumni at, which is Florida State University. And I want to go straight into it. I'm a little nervous, so hopefully um, this is informative and helps. It's just the fact that you're world-renowned and you've done a lot of great work and your legacy precedes you. Oh, well, thank you. Very kind. Um, so I heard you attended Florida State University. No, oh, no, indeed. When I finished high school, I, I, I Florida, that was very good. I couldn't go to school up there. You did not go to Florida State University? Oh, hell no. <laughs> what? All right. Yeah, uh, Maxwell Courtney, who was uh, the first black student to enroll at Florida State, uh, was like a couple of years younger than I was. Uh, he lived in this neighborhood, where, so I knew him from growing up uh, in the same neighborhood. But he actually attended the public high school, Lincoln High School. Okay. The old Lincoln High School, not the current one. And, uh, and I attended uh, the lab school with FAMU. You know? Wow. But, interesting. but, uh, but interestingly enough, he was the first black student to go to FSU. And that was like the, about two years after I had uh, finished high school. What year was this? Uh, 63. I think it was the first year you came in. Okay. I think it was 63, right? So, mm -hmm. I'm going to dive into the questions. Right? Okay, sure. All right. I believe African Americans suffer from PTSD. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I believe it is because if you were to take the concept or the clinical definition of PTSD and you apply it to a soldier that's been at war and has experienced or has um, been diagnosed with a mental disorder, PTSD, mm -hmm. then I would equate that to an African American or a person of African descent growing up in America that is from a violent or maybe nonviolent community, but violence in the sense of guns or maybe in a violent household, they suffer from PTSD. So do you believe that Africans, um, people of African descent suffer from PTSD? Yes, but not in the sense that you describe of it having been it, because of immediate experiences. I think it has a much longer genesis. In other words, I think it goes back to the actual violence of slavery. Wow. And then it's been, it, it's been passed on transgenerationally. And so what we see in terms of the symptoms you describe, in terms of the violence in our communities and the other things that constitute tra trauma now are really the symptoms of the transmission of the actual trauma that occurred during the violent eras of slavery and the post-slavery oppression, of uh, the lynchings, the killings, and all the other kind of post-slavery events that went on. And I mean, and I think that it, it actually was so traumatic that it not only affected those people at that time, our ancestors, who lived through that. I was watching one of your lectures online, mm -hmm. and you're talking about how um, some, is it okay to call them people of African descent or African Americans? Sure, okay. either way. Yeah. Okay, how some African American males um, are either extremely aggressive or extremely flashy. Mm -hmm. um, why do you believe African Americans feel the need to be flashy. Okay, okay. Um, now when you say flashy, what, what was I talking about? What is the context of that? You were talking about the gold chains, the gold watches oh, okay. to showcase how much okay. money that they have. Right. But why do you the materialistic that, the materialistic right. type of right. things, why do you believe mm -hmm. that many African American males feel the need to be materialistic mm -hmm. and flashing and showing off what they have mm -hmm. as opposed to building who they are as an individual on the inside right. and keeping those things to themselves? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, what you know, that 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 particular talk was really like, kind of like uh, taken out of uh, the kind of argument that I make in the book that I did. It's called Visions for Black Men, and uh, in fact, it's been recently revised. It came out last year, 
It's called New Visions for Black Men. And what I kind of lay out is that one of the consequences, and it becomes a good example of this kind of post-traumatic stress disorder that goes on transgenerationally, is that there are things that happen to us collectively that we are still struggling with. And one of those things is knowing who we are as people in general, as humans in general, and more specifically, as men and as women. And so what we've done is that we've taken superficial alien definitions of manhood rather than trying to explore the more, the, the more in-depth definitions of manhood, which are embedded in the culture and in the collective memory of us as a people, of all people. You know, that, that's how people uh, find their definitions of who they are uh, uh, as, a, as a people is based upon, like, it's kind of uh, embedded in the culture. And by having the culture decimated by the whole experiences of slavery and oppression, in 400 years, not being able to define our culture, but being kind of forced to uh, take in an alien culture, we then lost access to how to define ourselves. Did you ever see Boys in the Hood? Yes. Okay. I've seen Boys in the Hood. Well, okay. Well, John Singleton and, and Ice Cube were on with me, you know. On the Oprah show. On the Oprah show. Oh, so we were on that together. Okay. Right, right. Just as, I guess the movie was just being released. Okay. You know? And so she was interviewing the three of us about it. And so I was sort of breaking the psychological point of view. And uh, of course, John Singleton was talking about, you know, his interest in writing and directing it. And, you know, why he thought it was important. And Ice Cube was talking about the relevance of it to his upbringing. This was long before the Compton, straight out of Compton, you know, because mm -hmm. it really was talking about the same kind of uh, community, the same kind of upbringing that was depicted in Boys in the Hood, you know. So, do you believe that um, since you brought it up, Boys in the Hood had a positive impact on the African American community? Well, yeah, I I, I think that it's sort of like. It, it sort of put into a broader context what was being kind of like uh, that was that was being kind of discussed in a, in a localized kind of way. So the, the whole idea that I think that people sort of were, were, were dealing with the issues of like the violence in the neighborhoods and the kind of black on black crime, the gangs, gangs, all the gang killings and things like that of that particular time. They were seeing it in much the way that you kind of described it earlier, as being like a part of, uh, as constituting kind of the trauma of the hood, you know. I see. And, uh, and not seeing it as being both a consequence and a cause, you know. That it was actually like a cause, a, a consequence of trauma, but it was also a cause of trauma as well. Now what? Mm. Now what for people of African descent living in America? Now what after we've had the first, if you want to use a social constructive term, black president, um, President Barack Obama elected after his reign. Now we have Donald Trump. Now what for the state of people of African descent? Mm -hmm. And I want to start off with the first question, which is, I found out that you are one of the Distinguished Scholar recipient of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s award. Yes, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, and I want to ask you, the first question is, what do you think it takes to live the expectations of Dr. King's dreams? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I believe that, that first of all, uh, our development as a people, people of African descent, uh, in this time and in this place uh, are, are part of a process. Uh, it's been an evolution. Uh, our coming here, our sojourn here over the last 400 years, and now from here where do we go, is a process. And there's no part that is disconnected from what is preceded. It. And I believe that uh, the evolution and the arrival of Dr. King and his a significant contribution in terms of the struggles that he went through. Uh, I think that the ultimate kinds of accomplishments that uh, were, were demonstrated by the achievement of Barack Obama as uh, the first uh, 
uh, African American descent president at least visibly acknowledged so, uh, <laughs> because there's evidence that there are some other presidents who had some African lineage as well, but they didn't admit to it. But certainly for our, for ourselves, for all uh, for, for, for historical purposes, we we'll certainly claim uh, Barack Obama because he didn't deny uh, his connection. <laughs> You know, even though it was a mixture. It's kind of hard to deny, though. Exactly, exactly. But clearly, it is also very significant that he was clearly biracial, whatever that means. Yeah. You know, that in fact he was, in fact, of African descent. But the other part that you can't deny either is that he was also European-American descent. And that's a, a, a significant uh, combination rather than an authentically full-blooded African descended person, which is a part of the evolution, you know, where we are. Because he could not have been, he could not have been a fully descended African person and also have been representative in both his personal history and in his DNA, one who's gone through what we've gone through in this process. Because a part of the process, as Du Bois talked about, is kind of the double consciousness. We are, in fact, African and American. And that's a part of where we've come, and that's a part of the uh, contribution and the combination that has made us somewhat different from, but a part of, the, the, the continental Africans who we are descended from. You know. What should the vision of people of African descent be in America, and also what should their focus be now? I, I think it's twofold. One is that our primary vision is to heal ourselves by achieving mental as well as political and physical liberation. You know? So a part of our challenge remains the healing or the uh, liberation from the oppression that is, that, that, that is defined our presence in the Western Hemisphere. So during the time that we've been here, we've been here primarily as captives. You know, mm. we are distinct in our presence here as having been America's captives and not immigrants. You know, everybody, all the other groups who've come to this country, like came here voluntarily, selectively, and by choice. But those of us who are here as African descendants, up up African descent, that's throughout the Caribbean, that's throughout all of the Western Hemisphere. We are here at least our, our, uh, our, our current uh, 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 population is because of the fact that we were brought as captives. So a part of our first, so our first uh, challenge, given that, was to get free, to, to, uh, to come out of our physical captivity, get out of slavery. And so for the first 200 years that we were here, we had to struggle to get free from that captivity, the physical captivity the chains, the chattel, the slavery that, 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 that constituted. So the vision that we were driven by for those first 200 years was how to become uncaptured, how to become like, uh, uh, you know, free in order to be able to engage in being able to control our lives. Uh, that, that was the first part. So that vision was one of let us then get well, it was a reaction. So it wasn't a clear vision. The, the vision was simply one of how do we then get free from the bondage that is held by our captors. So our concept of freedom was not something that was self-motivated or self-generated. It simply was a reaction to what our situation was. You know. So that was, that was the Frederick Douglass, that was uh, Harriet Tubman, that was uh, a Sojourner Truth, that was the whole early history that we had in America. The next stage of our vision about what we wanted to do was that we wanted to be like the captors because our mm. concept of freedom wow. was still not a self-generated image. Our only concept of freedom was not to be free, there was not to be enslaved. So our image then is that we will be free when we can be like master. Wow. So we spent then another 150 years trying to be like master. 
Our concept was like, you know, let us vote like you, let us go to school where you go, let us not be segregated from you, let us live where you live, let us spend your money, let us go to your schools, let us wear your clothes, let us be just like you. But that was the vision of them. Uh, uh, we had, we had, they, had, they had systematically erased our memory of a self-generated generated image of freedom. And the only image we had was an image of freedom based upon what the only free people we knew looked like. Wow. You know? So that was our, our, our aesthetic of what was beautiful, what was wonderful, what was good. Even our concept of God in heaven you know, began to look like the master. So it was easy then for us to bow down and worship a blonde-haired, blue-eyed concept of God and want to be washed white as stuff. Because I, that was, again, the vision that was there, because that was all that we do. You know? So that brought us up to the Civil Rights Movement, the whole struggle of that, and in many ways, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the election of Barack Obama became the, the realization of that aspiration to be able to be free like the freedom that we had visualized. You know? So when you say, where do we go from here now? I would say that I would, what we must begin to do now is to generate a self-generated image of freedom. We must understand what it means to be free for us. And I think in many ways, what we learned were the limitations of aspiring to be free based on someone else's concept of freedom. So that's why I hold no sense of uh, failure in Barack Obama, because I believe that he was able to realize the fullness of what that vision could afford. We, we, can, we couldn't expect it. We should not have expected it anymore. But what we did expect, which is why many people were very disappointed, we actually expected him to be able to be free for us when he was in fact only a representation of freedom for someone else. Hmm. It was not our image of freedom that he realized. It was the image of like, what would it be like if a black man could be a white man and sit in the white man's seat of freedom? Wow. So that's what he did. You know. And then, to prove to you that that did not achieve freedom, voila! Donald <laughs> Trump comes along yeah. and shows you the sleeping bed giants who were always there and never out of sight, wow. but somehow hidden and obscured by our inability to see what real freedom was. And to show us that even after having had eight years of authority in the White House, that we had not achieved freedom for ourselves, and to show us how little we had achieved, we had to almost get a Donald Trump to take the veil off again and to say, this is what it's really like. You are free yet. So what we have to do is begin to like ask the same questions now, but not ask someone else, how can we be free like you? We must ask ourselves, how do we be free like us? Do you believe that people of African descent should refer to themselves as being black? No, I don't. I believe that we really should refer to ourselves. As, that's why I chose in my work, in my earlier work, I used to write about we used to even call it black psychology. And we used to work about, uh, we identified ourselves as black people. I think that was a, a, a stage in our development consciousness. But black is in fact a, is, is, is a kind of an internalization of someone else's definition of who we are. Because we, a people do not call themselves by, they don't define themselves by racial characteristics. That was a consequence of the oppressive system that we were put under. So racism created a racial identification. So being black versus quote unquote white was like a designation of power and a designation of possibility. And in fact was in fact underneath that the transmission of a certain spirit of denigration and exaltation. Because under that is this hidden notion of like, of the symbolic significance of white purity and black 
is something negative. So black is being the negative kind of the negative spirit, and white being the, the pure and the positive spirit. So I would so I would argue as I, I tried to, tried to do as in the, in the later the latter part of my my work in writing was to somehow argue that you know we really need to identify ourselves with a culture, you know, mm. with a culture. And and so when I say African, I'm not talking about the map. You know, something that's on this name after Leo Africanus, you know, this Roman who supposedly named the continent. After exploring it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's, that, that's, that's also a misnomer if you do it from that perspective. But to the degree to which this is the way that we can effectively identify a kind of a, a sociocultural, historical identification, identity, then we are more appropriate by beginning to, 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 to identify ourselves as, um, as African or African descent people. You know? Because within that is the idea that we are a culture with a unique history, with a unique identification, and with a unique definition of who we are, plus its self-definition. You know? But I think that that's really, even that has limitations. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that we probably should even be trying to, a part of the vision is to begin to get to the point that we can, through our own research, and our and, and research I mean both that is physical research, you know, a kind of anthropological kind of research, as well as spiritual research, where we begin to explore where we came from and what we are in our deeper non-material dimensions. Carter G. Woodson said, if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his action. That's right. How much of our thinking, us meaning people of African descent, how much of people of African descent's thinking do you believe is being controlled and manipulated on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay, now, how do you mean that? Do you mean like as a kind of conspiratorial thing that they have... Uh, of electrodes played out. No, 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 no. Okay. I meant how much of our thinking as far as the perception we have for ourselves. Okay. Oh, absolutely. As far as yeah. inferiority and superiority. Absolutely. See, we're mis first of all, we're miseducated fools, you know. I mean, we are thoroughly miseducated. Which means then, if you take Carter G. Woodson's concept, which is, by, by the way, that's the, kind of the theme that I talk about in my book, Know That Self, because I think that's the essential kind of idea that if you take that idea that if you control a per people's thinking, you don't have to worry about their behavior. In fact, you, they, you don't have to tell them to do anything. You don't have to control their behavior. They will do what you want them to do because their miseducation requires them to do it. They can't do it otherwise. And, you know, he uses in that book, in that, in that essay, he talks about the whole idea of that. You don't have to tell them to go to the back door. You'll yeah, just go. It just go, and it even goes further, which I always like. He says, and if there is no back door there, they will make one. Yes. You know, they will make, because their their miseducation makes them do it. You know, so here we are, like actually like being controlled, just like you're saying, but not by some kind of metaphysical device. <laughs> it's just by the simple fact is that the information that we have, how we define ourselves, what we know about ourselves, the history we've been given the ideas we've been given, what we've been given is reality and facts, all those things simply make us go and search for the other people's definition of who we are. So we're controlled by that. So how do you, how does one begin to regain control? Re-education. Re-education? Re-education. Where do you begin with that? You begin by uh, going and redefining our relationship to Africa, studying like how we are what is where we where we are in Africa as opposed to the Arabs and the Christians and the Ar and the Europeans redefine what Africa is all about? How do we begin to do that? You know, I mean, you begin in a very simple way. First of all, the, the first thing you have to do is to recognize and acknowledge that you are miseducated. You know? mm. If you don't know you're a fool, you can't get your, you can't get you can't get unfoolish. <laughs> so so that, that's the first thing. I mean, and that was why, in fact, I, 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 by the, the black psychology class that yes. I was talking about, when I taught that class, the, the first almost three weeks of the class, I dealt with that simple essay 
of the Carnegie was the best education in the world. I wish I would have taken that class with you. I, yeah, well, I, I retired I, well before I can even <laughs> attend Florida State. I'm sorry about that, <laughs> but uh, uh, but the idea was that, but but that's such a critical idea, I mean, and that for me explained why we need black studies. Okay. Even going to Florida State, you know, or even at FAMU, you know. The fact that we, eat, because FAMU, like Florida State, are both set up on a miseducational system. Wow. You know, I mean, they're, they're, there's no difference. I mean, the curriculum is just the same. You know, they still teach that the peak of human civilization comes out of Europe. They still, uh, they still direct people to look at the 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 the, uh, the, the, the theoretical basis of all civilized life are as the achievements of what the Europeans were able to accomplish. And they still put uh, Europe on top and Africa on the bottom, you know. I mean, that's in every aspect of there. They uh, still think about history as being his story and not hum the human story. The rest of the world is pretty much dismissed, particularly Africa, certainly the Eastern world, you know, I mean, China and all the rest of the world, all these civilizations that existed thousands of years before the rise of Europe. Uh, of Europeans, you know, they're not even they're not even included in the in the story of history. There's a brief little story of a few years ago of when the Europeans begin to uh, come out of their cave-like experience and begin to build a civilization. You know, so so my point is is that uh, you, you, the process begins by acknowledging that there is a problem, and then you begin to address the problem systematically in terms of rewriting, uh, redeveloping, and, re and redefining what education really is. From your perspective, you should be at the center of what education is really all about. If you read the, the, the ancient metanetra, uh, the ancient uh, so-called hieroglyphics, you know, that's how they refer to themselves. And they don't call themselves black people, you know, and those are, uh, but they, they call themselves people of Kenneth. And then, so when you understand that connection, and then that their their connection with West Africa, you also see a continuity in religion, continuity in culture, a continuity in lots of other things over there. And then, from there, you then need to when you then need to come to the critical points here in North America to find out like the whole beginning of the enslavement sort of thing, and uh, the residues of the plantations and uh, the shrines. The shrines being like the graves of uh, the people who we do know where they are buried, you know, uh, like Frederick Douglass, like Martin Luther King, or you know Rosa Parks. I mean, those because in going to their shrines, you know, we are able then to connect with the, the spiritual continuity of like how that whole process took place. You know, why is spirituality such an important and vital role to the nature of the African American? Because uh, unlike Europeans, our fundamental definition of who of what it meant to be human was to be spirits, having a human experience. In other words, Europeans define you know their Cartesian notion that uh, they they define their being, their ontological definition of self was I think therefore I am. You know mm. the, the Cartesian idea of cogito ergo sum. Think therefore I am. That's a great Latin phrase. And their idea was that to be, to be human, or to be, was to be able to think and experience the material world. The African concept of being was it came from like two two spheres. I am because we are. That's Ubuntu, right? Yeah, Ubuntu, exactly. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. I think therefore I am. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I, am I, am, I am because we are, but it, but it, but we are because we are connected by a spiritual bond, and none of us can be without our connection with each other, which with, and we are all tied together through the spiritual essence that makes us all who we are as human, and that's our fundamental definition of being human. Now that's a part of the kind of the retrieval of the African definition of self that we have been discovering through our work, say, over the last hundred years, you know. And I think that, like, even, I mean, when you begin to find in Du Bois's writings, you know, 
and things like that, how he kind of goes from, you know, his lofty Harvard education and all the good European stuff he knew, you know, even his, his, his whole system, his whole conception of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of his whole uh, kind of identification, but not kind of, his real kind of identification of communism, which more, was really much more his social principle of having a kind of a equalitarian notion of everybody being able to have a minimal, a minimal good, you know, as opposed to capitalism, which required people to have ups and downs, you know, people who have and have nots. And so his identification, the identification with Marxism and with, with communism had a lot to do with that. But that kind of evolved to when he writes The, the Souls of Black Folk, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, and when you read The Souls of Black Folk, he's already beginning to articulate that, you know, we are fundamentally spiritual. And there's a fundamentally spiritual aesthetic that defines what it means to be African. And by the time he's dead, he's buried in Africa, you know, mm -hmm. which is a part of that pilgrimage that you run into when you go to Ghana, because he's buried there, you know. And that, that in many ways is a very interesting statement about his hundred year contribution to the thinking of African people, you know, that he began from like found one of the founders of the NAACP mm -hmm. to being buried on the continent of Africa. W.E.B. Du Bois went back, even after he passed away, his body was buried there, as you mentioned. He was living there. He was living there. Yeah, he was an expatriate. Oh. He, he's actually, he had actually moved in Nkrumah. He went back to work with Nkrumah, who was the first president of the, independent, of the, of the decolonized African nation, which was Ghana. And so he moved, he, ex, he expatriated from the United States in order to go back and work with Nkrumah. And he had, he had a home in Ghana. So when he died, he was actually there, living there. Why is that, or why do you think many, I won't say many because I'll be speaking in generalization, but I've come across some people of African descent that refuse won't even touch going back to the continent. Yes. They oh, disassociate themselves completely and they look at people from the con on the continent as being less than they are. Tarzan movies. Tarzan movies? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just saying, I just said, that was just a flippant response. But, I, but, but that gets back to the point I was just making about the miseducation. What, mm. what, what most black people know about Africa is what they learn in the Tarzan movies, you know. That the white man was the biggest, the, the, the baddest thing in the jungle, and the, and the uh, the black people, the only the, the Africans, all they could say was Kimosabi, Kimosabi, <laughs> and they ran when anything came along, you know. And Tarzan would take it to beat the line by himself, barehanded, you know, ride the elephants, you know, talk to the chimpanzees, and had all the Africans carrying his baggage for it, you know. And, but 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 that's why. I mean, if you grow up, with that's the that goes back to how we are influenced by what we know. And so if we don't have any other picture, I mean, in my growing up, I mean, like, I never conceived that Africa could have been the place, you know, where the pyramids were built, you know. You know, uh, that was a different story. That was a, a different track. And, the, and they worked very hard in the kind of education that was given. I mean, from grade school, from kindergarten, yeah. to keep those realities separate. So that, that, that was the split in what was sub-Saharan Africa and what was, in fact, the Nile Valley of Africa, you know. And so being able to bring those two things together was a, was a major coup to be able to do that because you began to somehow see Africa in her true greatness as opposed to just the negative images of the black-white kind of thing. When I was growing up in elementary school, we used to have like Christopher Columbus Day. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, now that I'm educated in that arena, as far as knowing who Christopher Columbus really was, mm -hmm. I find it quite insulting. Yes, exactly. And uh, when I was younger, they used to have me, or I was one of the ones that would dress up as an indigenous person, and we'd run around, and we'd have dinner, and it'd be Thanksgiving. Mm. But knowing the reality of what happened, yeah. it's like, wow. And it, it's crazy to me because there's a lot of holidays, I would argue all of the holidays, with exceptions to Christmas, has bloodshed Yes, in right. America. You're right. 
And to You're think right. that unconsciously we celebrate these holidays, we have picnics, we have barbecues, mm -hmm. we're glorifying this bloodshed, mm -hmm. not realizing the spirit that lingers with it mm -hmm. and how it affects us and perpetuates in our lives in a toxic way. Yes, yes. And once I got educated on these holidays and I got educated on these things, it just, it sent me into a state of shock where now I really don't know what to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Make your own. Celebrate Kwanzaa. That sounds great. I'm going to have to do some research on that more in depth. And uh, I might apply that. I, I definitely, because now I'm just I'm just in a state of shock. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, now what? Yeah. Which is, goes back to the topic. Now what? Exactly. You know? Exactly. But, but it also, what, but what you just said, though, begins to give evidence of what I suggested is now, the answer to now what? And that's the process of re-education. So the more that you begin to learn, know, the more that you begin to find the directions that you need to be moving in and, and how you begin to, to create that, other, that new vision, that next vision that we need to begin to move towards and a, definition, and, and a vision that is self-generated and that will in fact begin to take us towards real inner spiritual freedom as well as the kind of physical material freedom. You know, it's interesting, you were saying that all the holidays are associated with some type of, of uh, bloodshed and violence uh, with that, you know. C Christmas is really like the god of materialism, you know. I mean, like, so even though they say it's the birth of Christ, it's probably the most materialistic debauchery, the uh, most, most de de uh, pagan of the holidays. And, and it gets celebrated by the kinds of things that go on. I mean, like there's more... Uh, uh, more drunkenness, more money spent that you don't have, sure. and it's like this 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 kind of feast of like you know let us bow down to the god of materialism, and the measure wow. of a good Christmas is how much shit you can get, you know, I mean how much stuff you can accumulate. You spend your food money, you starve your children, you not pay your rent, your, your, your utility bills go, you do all, and you have debt for the entire year. You know, in order to satisfy this craving, this lust, just a, a driven lust for, you know, like, how do I satisfy my material appetites, you know. And so it really is the same, it's on the same altar as the violence and other destructive kinds of things that are there. It just comes in this, this tinsel tape, this, all this tinsel and bright lights of color, but it all, again, it's just celebrating materialism. If you could look back at the younger you mm -hmm. and give yourself advice, what would you say? Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> um, I, 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 do you I, listen to Bob Marley? No. <laughs> I mean, I, I do, of course, I, I, I mean, yes, I do, I do but I mean, it's not a daily ritual. <laughs> but um, but I, mean, I, I know Bob Marley, I have followed his work for many, many years, and it very much, it, it, many of the things that he, 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 uh, that, that's in his work, in his music, you know, like, it, it's kind of a musical uh, rendition, a musical background to many of the things I've experienced yes. in terms of the growth of my, in my perceptions as well. So I'm, I'm very much in accord with the things he represents, you know. But, but what, I, then I, what I meant by that, this whole idea, is uh, uh, in looking back, just a lot of things that I fretted about and worried about was unnecessary because I feel, I think that if I'd had more faith in what I believed, I, more faith in what I thought I believed, uh, I would have had much less time to have to worry about worrying. Because things will take care of themselves, you know. Because I believe that the order is kind of set, and the processes will only help to ultimately restore the order, you know. So, um, and it's not for me or any other individual to try to change reality. That reality is set to be what it's going to be, and therefore you, you don't have to spend a lot of time worrying about those kinds of things. That uh, are going to be all right. I mean, like, for example, if, if I had the mindset uh, now that I uh, had at the age of uh, 23, say, 
um, probably with the election of D Donald Trump, I probably would just probably try to commit suicide. Either that or try to get with the group to go kill him, you know, because I really, I would feel so uh, disappointed that, uh, that some, the way that things look at this moment, that somehow I, not being able to see the bigger picture, uh, I would have been kind of overwhelmed with depression by where things stand now. Even though I, I'm still not happy about the way that things look, and there's a daily kind of agony of having to endure this, like in the bigger picture, I'm not worrying about it because I think it's going to be, no, I don't think, I know it's going to be all right. Really, I'm asking this question for myself. Mm -hmm. What should I do now? To what you're course? doing. You're doing, I mean, you're doing what I think you need to be doing. And that is like asking these questions of yourself, of the people you deal with, like thinking, focusing your study, your explorations on how do I miss it, how do I re-educate myself? You know, how do I find people who at least been trying to ask these questions? How, how can I ask them questions? How do I t spend my time and energy to try to come up with answers to the questions that are plaguing me? You know. So in other words, how do I begin to, what contribution can I make personally to being able to formulate the next phase of the vision that is necessary for the redefinition of who we are. In one of your lectures, you talked about people of African descent regaining wealth and resources. Mm -hmm. I own a business, and it's not good, very yet. Yeah, I create jewelry. Oh, good, excellent. <laughs> yeah, I create beaded excellent. jewelry and such. Excellent, okay. Um, but I want to be able to get to a position where I can have access to natural resources and natural wealth. Mm -hmm. Well, not natural wealth, but natural resources, mm -hmm. and then eventually accumulate wealth. And then I watched another lecture of yours where you talked about um, sometimes, or you talked about African descent men gaining wealth, gaining these resources in order to gain a woman. Mm. And so I found myself asking myself the question, what's the purpose of me wanting to, re to gain these things? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in some weird way, yes, some of it was tied into getting, attracting the opposite mate, if right. I'm to be completely honest with myself. Right, right. But at the same time, I wanted the wealth and the resources in order for me to influence people around me to help them get to another level. Right. right. The thing that I find difficult is how do I gain that if mm. I don't have a place to begin with? I don't have a father that left me with resources. I have a father that left me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Not a father that left me with resources. Right. So where do I begin as far as gaining these access right. to these things? Right, right. Well, you know, the thing of it is, is that uh, one of the, I, I, I think the point I was making in, in the, both in the book and in the lecture, that you probably heard about it, or heard about how we kind of misuse money, uh, you misuse wealth, you know, for the wrong kind of objectives. I think that's a, that's, that's a real, the, 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 the problem is not in the wealth. The problem is not in the money. The problem is how you use the money and not let the money use you, you know. Mm. And so it has to be then something that you deliberately choose to do rather than using it to achieve some type of uh, lower level objective, you know. So you don't want to like let the money pimp you, you know. I'd be like, you, you, you're the pimp for the money, you know. <laughs> Instead, you want to use the money to empower yourself to take greater control of who you are. So you, the money is your servant, you know. You're the money servant. is your servant. And you want it to work for you, and that collect that. And I mean, when I say you, I mean I am because we are, you know, the you that is the true definition of you, and not this the boy or the male definition. Because I talk about visions of black men, yes. the fact that we go through these stages, and like you don't want to, be, you don't want to be a rich boy or a rich male. You want to be a rich man. You see. So we have to learn to become a man. And you got the young, there you go, exactly. So, and, and so what I'm saying though, once you have the clarity of like the importance of like, you don't want a good job. You want to be self-employed, you know. 
So, so with that objective in what you do, then the resources will come to you, you know. And then, then you'll use the resources to be able to negotiate yourself, like, you know, into the position of the real wealth that you want, you know. So you don't have to worry about, I mean, like, you know, your father gave you the whole world, the universe, you know. I mean, it, and the father don't, don't leave you. And that is that the, 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 the divine creator of all that's good and all that's perfect, like, you know, if that's your father, you know. And the sperm donor who brought you into being, <laughs> you know, he is what he is, you know. <laughs> if he gave you something other than his genes, then that's a good thing, too. You'll take that. But, uh, but basically, uh, you know, he was only a, 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 an instrument, you know, to get you a, 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 to get you a uniform to wear while you're on this plane, you know. So, I've, I've watched one of your videos. I can't remember. Well, I watched a lot of your videos. Okay. But one video I watched in particular, you, you mentioned um, a phrase or a passage from the Bible. And you just mentioned now that our Father owns the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you believe, well, not do you believe, but in the Bible it talks about we, our Father owns a cattle of a thousand hills. Mm -hmm. Are you a man of faith? I know you're a man of faith, but are mm -hmm. you a man of faith in a Christian faith? Because um, I know you were practicing, you were Muslim. practicing Muslim. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, like I told you the other day, remember I told you the other day that I was an eclectic spiritualist. So that means that I don't see any contradiction between the basic messages that is in Islam, Christianity, and in actually um, most of the world religions. Most of the work that I did here, other than the classes, I taught at Florida State. We're done outside of town. I mean, I traveled all over the world, you know. And but most of the like most of the speeches, of uh, the presentation lectures you you see on on YouTube, they're things that I've done, I've done all all different places, you know, Dallas, California, like London, your London England, you know, all all over everywhere, you know. And uh, and I and I, I and I purposely, like stayed stayed on the down low here in Tallahassee. And a part of that was because when I came home, I went to rest, you know. And I didn't want to be having to speak every weekend doing something like that. So I mean, I, you know, I just didn't, I purposely was not known. Are you open to give a lecture? Oh, like, no. no. No, no more lectures? Oh, no, no, oh no, man. No, I would do that. I mean, I'm going to Detroit in a couple of weeks to do one, you know. But that's like one out of maybe three I'll do in a year, you know. And uh, I, I just uh, definitely not, nothing in Tallahassee. Nothing in Tallahassee? Yeah, I mean, I've done something in Tallahassee a couple of times, it, like since I've been retired. And basically, the response is pretty much like, uh, who, who, who's Akbar? You know, like, why, why, what does he have to say? You know, and uh, so it's not like, so basically, so I mean, there's not a lot of support for it, not a lot of interest. And with the with the lack of interest, there's not motivation much more motivation for me. I want to tell you that you are recognized in Tallahassee. I you <laughs> you poured into me so much. I'm sure he's learned a lot, um, and I'm sure there are plenty of other people that would want to learn more from me. So I want to thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you I so appreciate much. Your interest, right? um, I appreciate all that you've done for mm -hmm. people of African descent, African descent all around the world. Thank you. Um, so, with that being said, I'd like to know, can you sign all sure. my book? Sure, <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate your interest. Thank you very much. It, uh, you know, very often when you sit here and listen to yourself all the time, you begin to think, nobody does this crazy stuff with me. So, it's, it's good to know that someone else finds something of interest in what I've been trying to do.